We fret about the future a good deal. Perhaps too much. In machines taking over the world, climate change, the rise of autocracy, little things like that. And at times, it's too much. As if the weight of the world is on our shoulders. And in some ways, it is. And we should be concerned and engaged because the future is coming, whether we want it to or not. The question is, what are we prepared to do about it? It may seem misplaced in an episode where we're talking about the future, but since this is timeless leadership, I'm going to give a nod to a historian. Jacob Burkhart, the Swiss historian, said it's the historian's function not to make us clever for the next time, but to make us wise forever. And that forever wisdom travels with us to the present and into the future with a healthy understanding of who we are, where we came from, and what matters to us. We can build the future that we want rather than wait for one to be served up to us. And that's why today we're talking with Kate O'Neill about her new book, A Future So Bright, How Strategic Optimism and Meaningful Innovation Can Restore Our Humanity and Save the World. Have you ever admired a leader and wondered just what it is that makes her who she is? How he came to embrace the things that advanced him? Welcome to Timeless Leadership, where we look at the principles that define success. This is a show for leaders at all stages of their careers who aspire to understand what it truly means to be a leader. And who is a leader? Dolly Parton said, If your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. Together, we'll explore key principles, not only in the sense of fundamentals, but also in the ethical sense, the habits, character traits, and virtues that form the backbone of leadership. Principles that are just as relevant and essential in the 21st century as they were in the 1st century. This is Timeless Leadership. Hello and welcome to Timeless Leadership, where we explore principles and virtues that accompany successful and admirable leaders. Now in our second season, our listenership continues to grow and we do shows like this live every week on platforms like Fireside Chat, and then we package them up for listening later. Now, the bonus of listening live is that you have the opportunity to ask our guest questions. So feel free to follow up on Timeless Leadership in whatever podcast platform you choose and subscribe to the Timeless and Timely newsletter where we cover these topics in greater detail at www.timelesstimely.com. And we've got all the links you'll need in today's show in the show notes. This week, we're talking about the future and specifically with a look at reality with our guest, Kate O'Neill. If you ever need to brighten your day, one single interaction with Kate O'Neill will do it. Whether it's her million watt smile or her cheerful greetings online, she's likely to leave you energized to take on the day. Widely known as the tech humanist, Kate is helping humanity prepare for an increasingly tech-driven future with her signature strategic optimism. She's founder and CEO of KO Insights, a strategic advisory firm committed to improving human experience at scale. Among her prior roles, she created the first content management role at Netflix, developed Toshiba's America's First Internet, and founded Metamarker, one of the first digital strategy and analytics agencies. As a professional global and keynote speaker, Kate regularly speaks with leadership audiences around the world, exploring how data and emerging technologies like AI are shaping the future of human experiences. She's been featured and quoted in a wide variety of national and international media, including the New York Times, Wired, NPR, The Wall Street Journal, Marketplace, NBC News, 
BBC World News, and now on Timeless Leadership. Kate O'Neill, welcome to Timeless Leadership. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for that intro, for having me on your show. I mean, none of the rest of that matters. This is where it's at. <laughs> well, we're going to make it a great show today because, well, that's that's what the future holds in store for us, right? No, and I'm so glad that we get to have this conversation because it has been really intriguing to me for a while. Every time you and I interact kind of online, there is this intersection of historical views and the present and, and the future, and then thinking about how we lead into the future. And, and I just think this is going to be a really great intersection of our interests. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, people don't really uh, take into account historians or history too often when they're thinking about futurists. And I'm sure you've dealt with your fair share of CEOs who say, get me, get me that futurist, Kate O'Neill. And they, they want you to be a soothsayer of sorts. And how, how do you, how do you approach that when someone says, tell me what the future is going to hold for us? Yeah, I think it's, it's funny that that's how we think about what a future projection is or that we think about the future in terms only of predictions and not about how our actions and con and decisions today shape the consequential outcomes that we get to live with in the future. So, you know, I can certainly speak to the trends that look like they're leading into a trajectory that will shape the future. And I'm pr particularly good at that, as are many people who work in the futurist sort of space. But I think it's so much more important for leaders today to be thinking about what are they doing? What are we doing that is going to shape the future? What are the actions and decisions we're taking that actively shape that future? Yeah. Boy, there are so many ways I want to go with this conversation. Having read your book, I mean, you there, there are just so many ideas that pop into my head. So I want to try and address as many of them as possible and, and package this up so people can understand, you know, kind of how to make this manageable. Because to me, I think about the future, and the future is big, it's scary, there are huge issues uh, that I mentioned in the intro that are, you know, kind of weighing over us, and it seems like it's easy to just be paralyzed and say, well, you know, what am I going to do as an individual? What can I do to help solve climate change or, uh, you know, big tech uh, corruption or, or what have you? So uh, what do you say to people that look at the future and go, Oof, it, it's too big for me to do anything about. Yeah, you know, I think one of the things, and I say this uh, pretty early on in the book, I think one of the things that makes it difficult to talk about the future and sort of comprehend what the future is for us is that we've really only culturally been given two lenses to think about and talk about the future through, and that's dystopia or utopia. <laughs> so in <laughs> In literature and science fiction and entertainment, we've just generally, you know, reduced everything about the future down to those two ways of talking about it or thinking about it. And obviously, I think everybody knows that utopia is not really on the table. Like, no one believes that we're going to make all the right decisions and everything's going to go so perfectly right that we're going to live in this idealized world. So now all we're left with is shades of dystopia. And so I think that that is the framework through which we tend to see science innovations and technological innovations and a lot of what we deal with on an everyday basis, even those big existential problems like climate change or the climate emergency, you know, when we think about it only in terms of dystopia, it's this very disempowering way of thinking about the connectedness between now and future times, instead of this empowering way to think about the connectedness of us to our predecessors and us to the people who follow after us. And yeah. so I think that thinking about it that way really puts us back in charge of making decisions that, that shape the future. That's such a great point, Kate, this this binary, you know, uh, plus or minus good or bad kind of future. I mean, uh, you talk about dystopia versus utopia. We're, we're operating with myopia, uh, just a, mm -hmm. a nearsightedness. And, and look, myopia works both ways, looking forward and looking back, because we don't seem to recall too many of the mistakes we've made in the past and we keep stumbling forward. And right. as much as, you know, I like to look at history because that's where the certainty is. But when you think about, let, let's say like the, the founding fathers, when they were trying to put uh, the USA together, they didn't know it was all going to turn out. Okay. They had no idea what they were in, in for. 
And, and you know, we, we look back and they go, oh, well, we, uh, people in the past had it all figured out. They really didn't. We've been stumbling forward no. for all of humanity. And it's really about the decisions we make in the present that determine what direction we will end up going in the future. And, and I think it's even kind of funny to say, you know, they didn't know it was going to turn out okay, because I think it, at various moments in our history, if you stop telling the story right there, it doesn't look like it turned out okay. <laughs> so, you know, I think that there's this great quote that uh, that is a friend of mine quoted to me once and said that it was attributed to Neil Gaiman, and I haven't been able to find it, so I, I just take their word for it. It's that the difference between comedy and tragedy is where you stop telling the story. And I just think that's oh, one of the most brilliant like insights that. I've ever heard because everything does fluctuate between good and bad and things, you know, in our lives, in our personal lives, we always have to face tragedies, but we also get to have triumphs and, you know, wonderful moments in our lives. So I think it's, it, it requires this big picture view that you and I both, you know, tend to take of thinking about history and thinking about the future and recognizing that interconnectedness that between those timelines. Yeah, yeah, and I think one thing that really stands out, really, it's the 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 backbone of your book is approaching this with a sense of what you call strategic optimism. Can you help us understand what strategic optimism is? Maybe how it's different from the classic definition of optimism. Yeah, you know, it, it's funny that optimism is. It was a term that became part of my brand at some point, and and I I never really thought that much about it because I didn't really feel like I was an optimist per se. I would think I was like more of an idealistic pragmatist <laughs> in a sense, but but there was this way in which uh, a lot of what I would say on stage, um, people would come back to me and say, "Oh, I love how you're so optimistic about technology." I'm like, really? Because I say an awful lot of critical things about technology. <laughs> uh, but I think what's interesting about the way I think about this idea of strategic optimism is it is it is a both a model and a mindset. So starting with this full and bold and honest acknowledgement of where we are and what's good and bad about it and what we need to do about it. And then thinking about what the best possible outcomes of this situation might be. And then whenever we know what those best possible outcomes are, that sort of intuitively that ethically obligates us to pursue those best possible outcomes. Hmm. So we must work as hard as possible to achieve those. And I think what, what's different about this from optimism as, you know, kind of a blanket concept is optimism, I think, tends to be dismissed as a sort of folly of the naive and, and something that's just ignoring real world harms and ignoring, you know, the, the possible bad outcomes. And this is very much the opposite of that. This is saying, those real world harms, those possible bad outcomes very much exist. And we have to work to mitigate those while we lean into the best possible outcomes. Mm, yeah. You know, in, in some ways, uh, optimism as a brand has been tainted ever since uh, uh, Rogers and Hammerstein wrote uh, South Pacific, the cockeyed optimist <laughs> story, right? That um, and I think, you know, especially you, you know, knowing on this timeless and timely viewpoint, you'll appreciate, you know, the Voltaire Candide tie in. Uh, and that was something that my, my editor and my researchers were were literary PhDs. And they kept bringing up all these great examples throughout uh, throughout literary history of where optimism had been explored in literature. And so that was a really great piece of, of my uh, uh, side research as I was working on this book is, is making sure to understand that historical literary context for the discourse around optimism. And of course, it has been widely ridiculed, uh, and mostly because it does seem like it's a very insular way of thinking. It's a, it's a very, um, well, whatever God decides is what it should mm. be sort of way of approaching the world. And that's very much not what, what I'm trying to advance here. But I think it's interesting that the way we talk about even things like CEO optimism, or I just read an article of on uh, Chief Executive Magazine about CFO optimism, looking at 2022, uh, and and nobody takes it to think that optimists or that CEOs or CFOs are cockeyed and naive <laughs> in the way they're right. thinking about the future. It's just how much do they think that there's room to be positive about what could happen in the future? Yeah, and, and so and I think it's very interesting that the word takes on such different weight. 
Sorry, go ahead. Absolutely. No, and I think you color it really well um, in in the book, uh, calling optimism a balanced set of tools and using a, a turn of phrase that I absolutely love, thinking about optimism as hope as a service. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, that's, yeah. that's really, I mean, th- this is what, uh, well, realistic optimists do. They, they look for hope, right? They, they, they try to inspire people with hope rather than fear, but as a service means, well, you put it to work, right? You don't just put hope mm-hmm. or optimism out there as, as a, um, a, a, a virtue. You actually work towards it or work with it toward what it is you're trying to achieve. Exactly. I think that's one thing that really has recurred to me throughout my work on this, this book and the projects around the book has been this idea of our obligation to the views that we see, like when, when we can envision a better future, how much that ability to envision the future obligates us to it. And the fact that hope is this tool of focus because we have this ability to see what we want. You know, hope tells us what we actually want to have happen. And so it guides us. It helps us understand how to align our resources and assets, how to make sure that we're using all of the tools we have to move towards this future that we want to see happen. Mm -hmm. Uh, And when that, when we know that that can't happen, when there are times where, you know, circumstances remove that outcome as a possibility, then we know where hope can sort of refocus and where we can then reallocate our resources and assets. So I think it's incredible to use these tools in ways that truly align with what I think we already intuitively have and know about ourselves as humans. Yeah, it, it's nice to to hear it said out loud and and to uh, repeat and and to understand exactly where the importance lies. And you know the the title of your book being a future so bright. I love that you've taken this this concept of of brightness and you've actually mm-hmm. turned it into a model. Uh, a mnemonic that we can uh, use to remember exactly what we need to do when we're trying to develop strategic optimism. And you call this the, the, uh, the brighter uh, model. Can you, can you take us through that letter by letter and, and help us understand what the strategic optim- optimism model is? Yeah, sure. But first I have to add the caveat for anyone who hasn't seen the book yet that I actually do have a footnote when I introduce that acronym that I hate acronyms as models in books. <laughs> and I was just like, I'm going to do it anyway because I think it might help make the point. <laughs> but I just really can't stand it when these get used. So please hear this with a, a grain of salt all the way. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little bit cheeky with the terms that I'm using with this model because I, I just think it's so ridiculous. But but I think it's important to organize these concepts. So the, the B stands for be bold and honest about the fullness of the situation. So that's speaking right back to that idea that, you know, optimism as I'm trying to talk about it in this strategic model is not about ignoring reality. And then R is recognize what matters, identify, and I is identify what is going to matter. And this is this paired understanding that very integral to our human condition, our our human fundamentals is this notion of meaning. Like we're meaning makers and meaning seekers. And I talk a lot about that in my keynotes. I think it's a really important concept for us to really uh, grapple with when we're trying to understand how to build human-centric uh, experiences and how to do digital transformation in a way that's human centric. And so innovation, if, if meaning is about what matters, which is how I distill that down, then innovation could be said to be about what is going to matter. And I think that those two lenses on the now and the future are incredibly clarifying and important lenses. Mm. And then we have G for go all in on hope as a tool of focus and refocus. That's a little bit playful using G for hope. And then H is habituate to change meaning get used to it. (laughs) So T is tune in with empathy to anticipate what needs to change. And I I mean this in a way that is, again, this is uh, an overlap with what I talk about as the human superpowers. We have these incredible abilities to use empathy as, as a form of understanding what needs to happen around us and to use that as a, as a tool of clarity for what we need to work on. And then E is envision bold ways forward because nothing but bold ways forward is going to get us out of these existential crises that we face. R is finally resolve to work toward. And this phrase uh, that I'm about to say is one of the key phrases throughout the book, as I'm sure you know, Scott, from having read it. 
uh, folks listening, um, just note this phrase, the best futures for the most people. Mm. And that phrase comes up. I, I counted when I, when I had Tech Humanist, my last book, I counted throughout that book. It's 27 times that I referenced that <laughs> phrase. <laughs> and I say early on in the future so great, uh, it's very likely that I'm going to exceed that by a factor of like three, you know. Right. <laughs> <laughs> That's- but it's such an important, uh, I feel such an important grounding to, you know, these, this model, this way of walking through understanding this change landscape that we're operating in and how to make empowered decisions in spite of what, what seems daunting about them. Where we land on that last piece is very intentional because the, the idea is that any given moment when we're feeling stuck about which way to go forward on any given decision or action or program or product or, or marketing campaign or whatever, we can remind ourselves to ask which of these outcomes is going to create the best futures for the most people. And if we're being honest with ourselves, that should be just about all we need to know. Yeah. And, you know, it's interesting because I think what we're seeing play out culturally across the world today, certainly here in the U.S., uh, there are a lot of people who are fighting for, um, well, let's call it individual freedoms. And there seems mm-hmm. to be a focus on, on me and what, what I need and, and what my future is going to look like. Yet at the same time, we're faced with this, well, if you follow the media, a, a crisis of democracy. Um, it, obviously the pandemic, right? We've got these collective societal issues now that are really focusing what it is that we need to, we need to focus on that is really, really highlighting what we need to focus on and creating this incredible opportunity for us to pull together in the same direction. Do you think that's a, just a coincidence? No, I think it makes total sense to me in this cultural landscape, in this zeitgeist, you know, it's like, there's, there is under, an understandable pull toward the individual, especially in the U.S. We, you know, we are the culture of the, even the cult of the individual, you might say, uh, relative to most of the cultures of the rest of the world. But I think what's really important to take away is, is that none of what we're talking about, none of these tools, none of this model, none of any of this is meant to be uh, in contradiction to how important it is to be actualized as an individual that, you know, understand ourselves as individuals. But I think it's really important to recognize that most of these, uh, these change factors, as I call them throughout the book, these, these aspects of exponential change that are happening around us are happening to us collectively. And it doesn't make any sense not to use our human superpowers of cooperation and teamwork to affect collective action and reaction to these existential changes, to these exponential changes. Uh, so, you know, thinking about how to cooperate in terms of, you know, whether or not you agree with labor unions uh, or, or boycotts, but there's, there's so many types of group efforts that organize people in their roles of workers or citizens or consumers or just, you know, some kind of role in general. And I think, you know, there are going to be examples that align with people's priorities and values and that not don't align with the, their priorities or values. But the important thing is to recognize that collective action can actually make much more of an impact against the things that are causing us this kind of distress. And when we think about the pandemic, when we think about the climate emergency, when we think about intelligent automation and what that's going to look like for the future of work and the future of jobs, I mean, I think there needs to be a pretty a uh, widespread understanding that we're not going to get to better futures, brighter futures, without having some kind of bonding together and understanding how we can we can pool our values and pool what's important, what's meaningful into something that's actually going to shape better futures for us all. Yeah, yeah, and I, I mean it. It makes great sense. It makes intuitive sense, and yet. <laughs> we have people now who are don't seem to be able to be convinced of some of this stuff. And I, I just read a, an article on uh, Psyche uh, about uh, how conspiracy theories bypass people's rationality. And right. everything right. you just explained is completely rational. I get it. Um, 
and yet there are there are holdouts out there. There are people who do not want to be part of a collective decision for the future. How do you how do you begin to bring people along on that journey and make sure they're included that we all are uh, doing what's best for the most amount of people? So there's a couple things. One is that operating in the, a mass landscape, we're never going to convince people. Like in the context of uh, algorithmic optimization and the polarization of the social media landscape, people are just going to respond the way that the algorithms encourage the behavior uh, from people, which, which as we've been hearing more and more from Francis Haugen and some of these other uh, whistleblowers who are stepping forward, uh, reinforced by folks who are on the inside and in the know, that the algorithms have been amplifying outrage, potent form of engagement from people. So at that mass scale, we're, we're really truly never going to have agreement. But I think one-on-one and in small groups, there's a lot of hope for this. I have been on the road these last few weeks, which is a very strange thing to say, as you know, uh, the last uh, year and a half, um, like many people who make their living uh, with keynote speaking, I've been in my living room doing virtual keynotes. <laughs> so it's been delightful to get back on the road. But an awful lot of uh, the folks that I've met in, uh, in the last couple of weeks in smaller markets in the U.S. and, and in uh, leadership positions for uh, companies of different kinds have, you know, they've run the gamut of political views and ideologies. And we've had some conversations at receptions and, you know, after, after my keynotes. And it's been interesting to be challenged on these topics. And, and I think, you know, people have legitimate differences of, of the way they see the priorities, of how this stuff breaks down. But it's amazing how it's not that difficult for us to land at a place after, you know, 5, 10, 15 minutes of conversation where we say, you know what, your point of view makes a lot of sense. Mm. And I totally leave room for it. And, I, you know, I, I have these values over here. It sounds like your values are a little more over here. But it seems like what we can agree on is X, Y, Z. And I think that that kind of conversation is an, is an opportunity that many people don't get often enough. And we need to, we need to prioritize being able to have. Uh, but here's the other good news is that I, I read uh, along the way in, uh, I believe it was in David Wallace Wells's book, um, The Uninhabitable Earth. He talked about how in order to affect change on a cultural scale or a political scale, you really only need, out of any given population, something like 3% of the people to be engaged and huh. to try to you move the needle, right? And then, as I know, you say, huh, because it's like, well, that is still a fairly large number when you're thinking realistically about how that actually, you know, masses up out of, the, like, let's say, the U.S. population. But it's not daunting. It's not like you need to have 70%. It's not like, you know, trying to get to... Uh, herd immunity, right? It's, you just need a fairly small percentage of the population to be uh, empowered with education and to be informed and to be talking with one another and trying to lead the discourse. So I think there are some, you know, some positive things going on. I think we need to know that Facebook and a lot of those types of platforms are really poisoning our discourse and we need to, to move about that space knowingly and with with appropriate precautions starting to be put in place. But that's different from what I think happens when we're able to interact as humans with each other. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a great point. When we, we've seen that obviously uh, playing out in the news uh, in recent days with the Facebook papers, uh, just a deluge of um, information on the inside of exactly what people saw about this. You know, it's interesting, Kate, so many of the themes that are in your book are uh, some of the principles we've explored here previously on timeless leadership. We had Dr. Harry Cohen on to talk about, well, ostensibly optimism, but it's his philosophy of heliotropic leadership, you know, lead, leading with um, more optimism than negativity when you can um, and, and avoiding negativity in your life. We had uh, Tom Peters on to talk about humanism. You know, he is the, probably one of the ultimate humanists out there. And just in the last episode, we spoke with Margot Bloomstein about uh, trust. And you talk about truth and trust um, as, as a key part of the formula for moving ahead. I mean, what you just talked about in terms of engaging with people, I think, is a, 
uh, an extremely important uh, part of this. When you get down to that individual level, you're essentially building trust between two people, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, it's true. And I think what, uh, you know, in, in my work around uh, how data and emerging technology shape the future of meaningful human experiences, uh, one of the things that I find is that so much of our of our future, of our the experiences of our emerging future have sort of been outsourced to <laughs> to algorithms, to sort of data driven experiences mm. and algorithms. And you know, I'm I'm bullish on what algorithms can do for us. I'm bullish on what happens when we use data respectfully and and well and we and we can amplify meaningful experiences with with data and with algorithms. And I think that when you use those well and you build machine learning around that and, and AI around that, that you're, you're, uh, you're really starting to build something that could be incredible for humanity. As, as I talk about a lot in the book, there's, there's so many rich opportunities, but, but there's an awful lot of, of challenge to starting from a place where we have uh, already some divisions in the way that we, uh, the way our values are manifested in our political parties and our ideologies and when we have misinformation and disinformation actively being propagated through social media platforms, when algorithms are, you know, taking advantage of the fact that, that these things actually generate incredible amounts of engagement, um, that's where I think we're, we're running into the biggest problems right now. Uh, and so, so the opportunities, uh, so a couple of the opportunities that I thought were very interesting, and tell me if you found this interesting too, was... That uh, the finding within Edelman's trust barometer mm. that business was the institution that had the most public trust right now. This is in Edelman's 21, 2021 trust barometer, in case anyone's listening and wants to look into that. I mean, I found that fascinating. It's got 61% trust globally and the only institution seen as both ethical and competent. What? We're talking about business? <laughs> Right. Exactly, right? <laughs> but out of the four, government, NGOs, media, and business, you think about it, you can break it down and you go like, well, yeah, media and government, I can see where public trust has definitely eroded in those institutions uh, through a variety of factors in the last few years. And NGOs, you know, kind of get tainted by that same association, I suppose. And business has this opportunity. And that's what I think is so incredible right now that if you are a leader in business, you have the opportunity to take principled stands and actually lead the discourse forward and help us, help us figure out how we're going to be, you know, better humans and live in a more aligned way toward the futures we're trying to create. Yeah. Or conversely, um, just kind of throw your arms up in the air and say, well, the hell with everything. I'm, <laughs> I'll be circling the earth in my spaceship. Uh, the rest of you uh, suckers, just good luck to you. <laughs> yes. Conversely, you could do that. No, not that anyone's doing that. Not that there's any examples that we could talk about that, where that's happening. Uh, so, you know, I think what, what's, uh, what's fascinating too is when, you know, coming back to misinformation, you know, that we have this, uh, this crisis of misinformation and that the, as much as I love Twitter, I spend all my time on Twitter. Uh, you know, if, if folks are on Twitter, I'm Kate O, K A T E O over there. Um, and I, and I, I think that it's a, a fantastic tool when you use it well, but it's incredible the examples that I was able to find in my research of how much, um, misuse, how, how many people were using the platform in ways that were not very bright, let's say. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, we, we had uh, examples on um, people uh, retweeting articles that they had not read. Of course, I don't think that surprises anyone to find out. But there was actually a, uh, this is one of my favorite examples from the book, that there was a, a, a satirical website, The Science Post, that had written an article and shared it that said that the headline was 70% of Facebook users only read the headline of science stories before commenting. And <laughs> that article racked up almost 130,000 shares, even though if you actually clicked on the article, it was Greek filler text, lorem ipsum text all the way through. <laughs> oh my God. 
<laughs> not surprising, really. No, not surprising. Hilarious. Yeah. Uh, and and also dangerous, but not surprising. <laughs> yeah. So I mean, yeah. that's 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 an interesting observation because how can you take what what essentially is confirmation bias, right? People are mm-hmm. uh, predetermined to kind of think in a certain way. How could you possibly? And maybe you can't, I don't know, but how could you possibly use that kind of thinking to steer people into better preparing for the future? So I think that there's some intermediation that that can happen. There was uh, an example, actually, I wrote about it right around the time of citing that example, where um, Twitter rolled out a feature in late 2020 that asks users when they're retweeting an article if they want to read the article first. And people may have found that patronizing, but it, it, because of experiments like that, we know that there's, there's data that suggests that we need those kinds of intermediations. We need, we need for the platforms to be taking a more active role in, in trying to, you know, facilitate good digital citizenship and good behavior. So I think, you know, there are opportunities for, for the platforms themselves. And there, and there's certainly responsibility, I think, that those, um, platforms bear. Uh, for for what should happen on the platforms, they're not exactly publishers because they're not directly creating the content, and they're, but they're not exactly platforms because that suggests a level of neutrality and detachment from what's happening on those those platforms or, or on, on those sites. So that because they're algorithmically optimizing what content users are exposed to and enhancing their engagement that way, they're obviously not neutral. And so my friend and and the tech ethicist David Ryan Polgar calls them public squares. And I think that that's probably as good of a model as, as any to think about. It's a government-run resource in the public interest, which means it shouldn't run, be run by a private company. Now, we could, you know, we could all agree to disagree or we could have a very lively debate about whether that's true in, in practice or not. But I think it starts us having a very informed discussion about what kind of intermediation probably should happen here, what kind of regulations probably need to be uh, developed around the appropriate uh, governance of of user data and the the kinds of experiences that people have mm. in these realms. Yeah, I mean it, it's certainly a, a question we're all either grappling with or seeing that it's grappled with uh, in in the public square, uh, ironically, right now. So mm-hmm. um, now, in addition to um, big tech, I mean you've you've outlined um, where we might apply strategic optimism in some major areas uh, of, of the world, uh, the climate, uh, jobs, education, uh, privacy, even what we eat. Right. Um, yeah. Where do you think we can have, well, let's say the, the biggest impact in the shortest term? Well, the climate got such a front and center treatment because I really don't think that anyone could possibly suggest something to me right now that seems more urgent than dealing with our climate. Uh, the climate change situation is really a climate crisis at this point. And I think the more you read of the literature around climate, the more um, harsh and daunting the reality becomes. So I think that that was, that was the first important thing I felt like I needed to do after spending so much time researching this space. I wanted to make sure that I could apply the strategic optimism model to climate, but also the first step, as I mentioned earlier, in the strategic optimism model is to be bold and honest about acknowledging the full reality of the situation. So acknowledge the climate reality is the, the first sort of section within the brighter future for our climate discussion. And it's a, it's a hard reality. It's, it's to know that to really look at the, the data and at the science right now is to understand that a certain amount of, of uh, heating and uh, what's the damage that we're going to experience is already on course to happen and will not be able to be changed. And, and that is frustrating and tragic and sad and very, very hard, I think, to, to really let our minds grasp and our, our hearts process. But beyond that, there is the opportunity to, to change the trajectory of whether it's going to get really, really, really bad or merely <laughs> really bad, right? Like, I think that that's a pretty significant difference when you really understand, you know, if you, if you get, get familiar with what the difference between a, a sort of one and a half degree versus two degree aggregate global warming 
means uh, to, to different places on the planet and different populations on the planet versus a three degree increase in temperature or four or five or any of these. These are all actually possible kinds of trajectories and the uh, devastation that comes with them is, is very easy to, to visualize. So, yeah. uh, so I think that, that that felt like the most important thing for us to really lay out on the table and to say, look, the, the, as someone who has spent my, the, the greater part of my career in the technology space, I know that technology is not going to be the, the only answer to this. But I've also spent my career around leadership, and I've also spent my career around strategy. And I think if we pull some of these tools together, what we can do is use this strategic optimism model to, to try to understand what we're really dealing with. Use our leadership tools to guide us into the right space. And then, hey, use technology because there's an awful lot of really cool stuff that's happening in the emerging technology space, especially around AI, that could accelerate the heck out of the work that we're trying to do to re-sequester carbon, to clear, clean the water, to, to you know, make resources more available for people, to, to make food and water distribution uh, more effective and, and, and better for people yeah. and so on. It, it, it's so powerful once you really start looking at it. Absolutely. I mean, you, you raise a great point there. It, really, it's about the, the strategic application of technology because I think we're, we're, we're all too, well, dare I say, jaded about, you know, the last decade and a half of uh, particularly online technology, which is, let's face it, the, the way most people view technology. Um, as solutions for the 1%. You know, how do I get a cab faster? How do I get my food delivered without having to talk to a human being? How do I connect with friends and family more frictionlessly? Um, and yet, the the application of technology you're talking about is technology that can literally change and save people's lives. Yeah, yeah. And I think that that part is is the part that it, it would be irresponsible for us not to use all of these tools in, in the, the most meaningful ways possible, right? Like if we're trying to figure out what is meaningful innovation, you know, I've, I've been asked multiple times about this subtitle of the book because it is obviously a really bold set of statements about strategic optimism and meaningful innovation, restoring our humanity and saving the world. But honestly, I feel like what, what better way to think about what matters and what's going to matter than sizing up the full and realistic landscape of the problems that we face and the opportunities that we have in front of us, the resources that we have, the tools we know we have and that we're developing and matching those up and saying, hey, look, yeah, we, we're, we're facing unprecedented change with the climate and we, we, we haven't even begun to fully grapple with how bad it truly is mm -hmm. already. Uh, but we have done unprecedented work in creating these amazing tools. And what we haven't done is match those very well. What we haven't done is say there are tools. And, and I go through this in, in some detail, uh, looking at the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals as a model and calling out within those 17 goals, which for anyone who, listening who's unfamiliar, these 17 goals talk about how to improve the quality of life on this planet for all people, for all living things, not just humans even, but animals and, and life on this planet. And so, so it's looking at things like, you know, the uh, no poverty and uh, quality education, uh, but also things like life on land and life below sea. But there are, for every one of these 17 goals, I've been able to find proofs of concept, at least, of AI and other kinds of emerging technology developments that speak directly to how to improve those goals, or, or, or improve the, the measurable output along those goals. Yeah. So, yeah, so I, I just think it's, it's an incredible opportunity if we allow ourselves to really let it sink in and really see what can happen by making those things better aligned. Well, in our in our closing moments here, Kate, I want to circle back to something a little more lighthearted, um, maybe, <laughs> maybe to um, uh, just, just to help people uh, understand where you came from. You were actually one of the first 100 employees of Netflix. And as we know, Netflix uh, has uh, an amazing uh, algorithm, uh, use of AI to serve up content to people. And, you know, I think back 
over the last few years on Netflix, we've had shows like Black Mirror, uh, now Squid Game, uh, with, with a very different view of a future or even a present um, as, as to what the world could look like. And those have tended to get a lot of viewers. What do you make of that? Is it is it people getting scared? Is it people maybe just using it as escapism? How does that fit into our brighter future? It's a very good question. And to be honest, I don't know because I, I am not drawn at all to any of that stuff. <laughs> I, I, hard, I hard to believe. Never, hard to believe. <laughs> I've never had the least bit of interest in science fiction just generally. And I've never had the least bit of interest in um, fantasy uh, dystopia or utopia, but, but, uh, but certainly this trend toward these dystopian sci-fi types of, of explorations have, <laughs> they mystify me. The only thing I think, I guess I can think makes any kind of sense is that this is a form of, um, inuring ourselves. <laughs> so like sort of, uh, yeah. sort of making it feel a little less bleak because we've seen it in a sense. Like we, we think that we're prepared because we've seen what might be coming. Uh, and maybe that's only happening subconsciously. Maybe people are just enjoying the entertainment of it um, for whatever that is. <laughs> don't, again, don't understand it myself. But I think that there's a possibility that it is a sense in which uh, subconsciously we're saying, we're allowing ourselves to think like, well, it can't be so bad now because I've actually watched you know, Westworld or <laughs> Squid Game. Or <laughs> bring on the worst. I already know what's coming. And I, I guess, you know, no one really wants to watch, you know, utopian fantasies all the time. And I, I wouldn't want to either. But I think that what, what interests me about literature and entertainment is the human condition. Uh, and I know yeah. that many of these shows do explore the human condition in, in their way. Uh, but, but I think I'm more interested in the possibility that maybe we're, we're on the verge of creating new content, creating new kinds of entertainment that, that look at what human beings are capable of when we when we exist in our natural environment in ways that are that are harmonious and when we can say look we've got all this incredible potential and all this incredible smarts and we've got resources and we've got you know innovations that we've and, and inventions that we've made why don't we figure out how to use that stuff really well and of course you know we're going to have challenges and drama and you know kind of relationship battles to overcome and you know people are not always going to be at their best and that's going to be the interesting part of it but then i think it, you know to show us actually trying to overcome challenges that are on this grand scale would be exciting so call me netflix <laughs> that's great <laughs> so any any last words of strategically placed optimism for us as we consider the future that we are about to embrace kate Oh, you know, the, the words that I left it with in the book are the ones that I think are the most important. And that is the reminder that everything is connected. Every time we have the chance to remind ourselves to think about the best futures for the most people and to remind ourselves that everything is connected, we'll do so much better for, for that. And we, we need, we need to be thinking about that on a business level, on a, on a technology level on every level that we operate. So I encourage you to think about that. And I, I'm, I'm so excited to, uh, to bring these, these ideas to your audience. Scott, thank you so much for having me on your show. Well, thank you, Kate. I am so glad that we are connected. And I would encourage other people to connect <laughs> with Kate on Twitter at Kate O. This is Kate O'Neill, author of A Future So Bright, How Strategic Optimism and Meaningful Innovation Can Restore Our Humanity and Save the World. You can also find her website at koinsights.com. Thanks again, Kate. Thank you. The future is coming, whether we like it or not. If we recognize what matters, go all in on hope, get comfortable with change, and make bold progress with empathy, we can work toward the best futures for the most people. Thank you for joining us and for being an advocate for timeless and principled leadership, whenever and wherever you find it. I'm Scott Monty. Until next time, may you dream more, learn more, do more, and become more. For you are a leader. <laughs>